Hi, welcome or welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'll be installing a two inch Mopar lift kit with Bilstein reservoir shocks on a 2022 Gladiator Eco Diesel. This video isn't an instructional video, but it will give you a good idea of what you're gonna be up against if you try to do this job yourself. Um, this video is not sponsored. I will have links in the description to different items that you see in the video. I do get a small commission if you use my link to purchase and it helps me out, helps the channel out. So even though this is the first time I'm installing lift kit, I've done a lot of work on vehicles and mechanical work over the years. Mopar does include a very detailed instruction sheet on the step-by-step -step process that you need to go through to successfully install this two-inch lift kit. I'm going to try to follow these instructions as closely as possible. I think I have every tool that I'm going to need. Let's get going and get this lift kit installed. I recorded that intro before I started installing the lift kit. I learned a few lessons along the way. Here are some of my opinions on what I learned. Number one is the instructions are meant for a mechanic who already knows what they're doing. They'll help a novice, but they're still going to be a steep learning curve. I watched several install videos. They were good, but the creators left off a lot of the struggles you will encounter and that add a lot of time to the project. Number three is working the driveway the way I did made it a lot more difficult. In fact, the Jeep should be lifted on a lift or jacked on four jack stands left that way, put in neutral until the entire job is completed. Neutral allows you to manipulate the axles better, which helps you with putting the new springs in. The axle must be supported on both sides. I use my floor jack and my bottle jack with my bottle jack buddy. After you have your vehicle jacked up, safely supported on jack stands or on a lift, the first thing you need to do is start loosening some bolts. The track bar bolts need to be loosened. The upper and lower control arm bolts need to be loosened at the axle connection and at the frame connection. In my case, there's a heat shield that blocks access to the bolt on the upper control arm attached to the frame. I had to remove this heat shield in order to get at that nut. On the passenger side of the Eco Diesel, there's a diesel particulate filter that makes it a little more difficult to get the heat shield off. This bolt has a flag nut on the other side, so you will not have to put a backup wrench on that to loosen this bolt. A lot of the other bolts on the upper and lower control arms are going to require to be backed up with a backup wrench to loosen the bolt. It may be a little awkward to do so holding a backup wrench and applying enough torque to loosen the bolt. I developed a couple techniques where I used a strap to hold that wrench for me. You can see here where I use the cam strap to hold the wrench and that allows me to use both hands for other purposes. So I have all my control arm bolts are loose. Upper, lower control arm bolts are all loose on both sides of the vehicle. Now the instructions are telling me to go ahead and remove the sway bar end links and the shock absorbers. But the next part of the instructions tell you to loosen all the brake lines and the other ABS lines and, and other electrical lines that are hooked up. I think I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and, and skip ahead and loosen all, all these brake lines like this and over here. It tells you to loosen them, um, take them loose, because if this thing drops and stretches those out, um, it could be in a lot of trouble. You can see up here where they've built in a loop here that gives you some slack. I don't see any reason for not going ahead and getting all these loose now, and that way if this axle drops more than it's supposed to or something happens, I won't be stretching these lines out and pulling them. That, that could be a major deal. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and do that. I removed the brackets that hold the brake line on the frame and also on the lower control arm on both sides of the vehicle. I also removed the electrical connector from the locking differential and cut the zip tie so it could stretch out the extra two inches. I removed a clip from the frame so the diff breather tube could stretch out the extra two inches. On the passenger side, I removed the electrical connector from the FAD, the front axle disconnect and cut that zip tie so that could stretch out an extra two inches. Now I was confident I could remove the sway bar connectors, the shock absorbers, and lower the axle enough to get the old springs out. To remove the sway bar links, you use an 18 millimeter wrench and a six millimeter Allen wrench on the top of the bolts. On the bottom, you just need an 18 millimeter wrench. 
you got to remove these and not use them again. You're going to replace them with two sway bar links that are two inches longer for the new lift kit. 18 millimeter socket. The shocks come off pretty easily and once those shocks are removed you can remove the springs. Removing the springs you need to lower the axle. You may want to lower one side and raise the other side to make it easier to get one spring out. You might want to lower both sides. It all depends on your situation. While you're lowering the axle, be careful of the drive shaft. You could lower it so much and put it on such an angle that it could be damaged in the process. When you remove the spring, you're going to find that the rubber spring isolator falls down. Make sure you save that because you need to reuse it. You have to be careful so you don't damage your drive shaft. With a passenger side spring removed, I can move on to replacing the lower control arms. The last of the old parts to be removed will be the lower control arms, and the new lower control arms will be the first parts that you reinstall. Comparing the old lower control arm with the new lower control arm, there doesn't appear to be a heck of a lot of difference. Maybe a quarter inch in length and maybe the radius of the bend is different. I got the new passenger side control arm installed without much trouble. The driver's side went in pretty easily also. All I had to do was adjust the jack and use my hammer and drift pin to line up the holes. These upper spring locator collars, they get reused and they have two tabs on them. And those tabs have to go into two holes top here. Now it's easy to get in the hole, but it's hard to get it to stay up there. I'm going to put a little piece of painter's tape on here. I can see the two tabs sticking up now over here and here. I got my painter's tape on there holding it up. Let's hope that works. You get new coil spring isolator pads with the kit. They're labeled left and right. Here's the old coil spring for the front compared to the new one. The new one is the one with the black and it's a little longer. You have to make sure that you get the exact right part number because each corner of the vehicle gets its own spring and it also gets its own shock absorber. Now it's time to install the spring and one thing you have to remember to do is to put your bump stop extension inside the spring before you install the spring because you won't be able to get it in there after. I zip tied mine in ahead of time. Actually installing the spring required adjusting the axle up and down a couple times and just fighting with it and figuring it out and getting that thing in there. It took a little while but I did get it in eventually. And there's only one way that the spring can fit into the top and bottom spring isolators. So you have to absolutely make sure that those are in there properly or there's a chance that you could lose a spring while you're driving. Now that I got the spring installed, I needed to flip that bump stop extension over and put that threaded portion down through the hole and then get the nut on the bottom of it. And it turned out to be a nightmare because I didn't have the exact right tool. I had to make something up and I'll tell you more about that. At this point in the video, I need to install the bump stop extension here in the front on the frame. I didn't get any video of doing that, and I didn't get any video of putting the shock on. I did get video of putting the reservoir on, and I didn't get any video of putting the sway bar end link on. The reason is, is because I was running out of time. I had been out here all day. I ran into uh, just a heck of a problem putting that bump stop extension in. It was, it was terrible. I didn't have the exact right tool to do it. I tried a bunch of different ways and I think I was spending, spending about three hours putting two bump stop extensions on. A job that should have been a five minute job to put both of them on. But I'll show you how I overcame it. Finally did get them on there. And what I ended up using was a vice grip with a socket on it and a strap wrench, which I just happened to have in my toolbox. I'll show you the details here of how I did it. And I would love to hear in the comments because, you know, if I ever install one of these lift kits again, I'd love to hear a lot better way, whatever you guys come up with, especially uh, you guys that are like super mechanics. Here's the bump stop extension right here. Now, here's a brake bracket. Now, picture this shock absorber is out of the way. This brake bracket is out of the way. And that gives you a opening right down here, if you remove that brake bracket, to get a wrench or a socket in. Now, I didn't have... Now, the problem is, is you go in... And then you have to go up to get to the nut on the bottom of the thread of the 
bump stop extension. I did not have the proper length socket and I did not have the proper wrench to reach up there. I'm not sure if there's a special tool or what a guy would use. Leave it in the comments, let me know if you do know. But I ended up putting my socket in through this opening and I'll show you a picture of this without the cover on there, without the uh, brake line bracket on. And you can see you can get this opening here and get something in and then up on this bottom of this 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 bump stop extension and once I got my vice grip in there I used my strap wrench to grab this this uh, bump stop extension and turn it onto the nut Instead of me turning the nut onto the thread I held the nut in place and turned the bump stop extension with my strap wrench and it was a tedious process. It, I didn't come up with it for a while, so it took me about three hours to get both of these bump stop extensions on. And to make it even worse, there was some, some galvanized coating on the nut and the bolt that made it very difficult to thread that nut on. I thought I was cross-threading it, but I wasn't. Anyhow, that was a big holdup. Stopped me from getting, uh, I, I needed to get my tires back on for the night and pack it in. So I didn't get any video of, I just rushed to get the shock and, and the sway bar link on that night so I get my tire back on. So that was one big problem I ran into. Like I said, let me know in the comments if you guys have a, a better way of, of reaching up and tightening that nut on these bump stop extensions. Now I needed to install the Bilstein's remote reservoir. The reservoir is held on by this aluminum bracket that's supplied in the kit. The bracket is held on by a couple of rib nuts that you'll install in the frame in the front of the vehicle. Unfortunately, one of the two rib nuts or nut certs that was supplied in the kit was too small for the hole in the frame. I looked through my supply of rivnuts in the garage and using my rivnut tool, I was able to install it in the frame and it ended up being a perfect size to hold the bracket on. I got both the reservoirs installed on either side of the Jeep and I have to say that it does look like a pretty awesome setup. Now I have all the parts that came in the two inch Bilstein lift kit installed in the front portion of the Jeep, but I still have to get underneath it and retorque all the bolts that I took loose. Some of the bolts on the lower control arms get torqued to 190 pounds. I had to go buy a brand new half inch torque wrench. If you do this job, make sure you check the torque specs that come in the back pages of the instruction manual. The Gladiator is looking pretty good, but I still have the lift kit parts to install on the rear of the Gladiator. This is day three of my Jeep Gladiator lift kit install experience. I've got the Gladiator jacked up. I've got it on the jack stands. I've got the front wheels well chocked. I actually put it in four wheel drive to make sure it didn't roll down the driveway. And I'm ready to get going, loosening the track bar and the control arms, just like I had to do with the front. The locker's electrical connector is the only one that you have to take loose in the rear of the vehicle. And there's an extra two inches in that line that's provided also. I started off the rear installation of the lift kit by removing the sway bar links on both sides of the Jeep. Just like the front, it required an 18 millimeter wrench and a six millimeter Allen wrench. With the sway bar end links removed, I could start lowering the rear of the vehicle to remove the existing springs. That thing that fell down you see in the video is the spring isolator, rubber spring isolator. And it became pretty difficult to get it to stay up there, but I learned a trick and I'll show you later in the video how I got that to stay up when I was installing the new spring. And watching this reminds me of just how difficult it is to work on the ground when you're doing a job like this. Very challenging. Time to start installing the new springs in the rear of the Gladiator. Each spring has a number, so it corresponds to a corner of the Jeep. And I used some double-sided tape on the spring isolator, and it's ready to go. This spring went in easy. I took the brake calipers off so I could lower the axle, but I was worried that if I lowered the axle too much, it might screw up the drive shaft. So hopefully I didn't do that. So I lowered the axle enough. This spring went in really easy on the driver's side, on the passenger side, there wasn't anything in the way. All the new parts are on. Sway bar end link, bump stop extension, new Bilstein reservoir shocks, 
the new spring, reattached the brake caliper, everything's torqued. I'm going to put the tires on, take this thing off the jacks, let it sit down, and then I'm going to retorque. I had to retorque the upper and lower control arms and the track bar on the rear. And if you're going to attempt this job by yourself, make sure you have a 200 pound torque wrench and the ability to lay on the ground if you're doing it on the ground and push that torque wrench pretty hard to get those foot pounds that you need. I took the Jeep down to my local 4x4 shop, had an alignment done. The specs that they gave me in the manual were wrong, but the alignment shop knew what to do. It drove great. We took it on a 2,500 mile trip and it drove perfectly. We haven't done any off-road yet, but that's coming up. At first it went up about almost three inches and now it's back down to about two and a quarter. If the video helped you out, hit that thumbs up button, leave me a comment, and consider subscribing to the channel. It really helps out. I'll see you on the next one. And don't forget, on Muddy Ruts, the best is yet to come.